Welcome to episode 106 of the Microsoft Cloud IT Pro Podcast, recorded live on December 5, 2018. This is a show about Office 365, Azure, and the IT Pro and end user side of life, where we discuss the topic or recent news related to Office 365 or Azure and how it relates to you as an IT Pro. In this episode, Ben has a chance to sit down with Jason Moore and Stephen Rose at the Live 360 conference in Orlando, and we talk about the history of OneDrive and where it is headed. This is Ben. We are here live at the live at the Live 360 conference in Orlando. I tracked down Stephen Rose, who we had on the podcast back at SharePoint conference in Vegas in May. Yep. And we got Jason Moore here too, who has a long history with the OneDrive product and all the former iterations. So I'll let you guys introduce yourselves, tell us a little bit more about you guys, then we'll dive into a little bit of an interview here. Sure, I'm Jason Moore. I'm the uh, partner group program manager at Microsoft, responsible for OneDrive, both the consumer product as well as OneDrive for business at school and educational institutions today. And I've been at Microsoft for about 18 and a half years all up, largely working on files all the way back from doing Windows Explorer work in Windows XP and even some work before that through OneDrive today. And I'm Stephen Rose. I am the senior partner, uh, senior product marketing manager. I've been at Microsoft for 10 years, so I worked on and launched for IT pros Windows 7, Windows 8, Windows 8.1, Windows 10, and then about two years ago, two and a half years ago, came over to OneDrive and... um, own our blogs and our social media and all you know our docs.com site all of our all of our content so it's great i'm still out there and get to work with it pros and make sure they have the right tools to get the job done mover is a cloud migration company that specializes in moving your company's files from file servers or cloud storage like box dropbox and google into office 365 Their patented technology makes Mover the fastest OneDrive file migrator in the world. Moving dozens of terabytes of data a day is a breeze. Use Mover's free, industry-leading migration guides, or ask for a managed migration and they'll take the lead. With Mover, all your data is secure and intact. Running completely behind the scenes, you don't lose time, money, or hair while you transfer. Scan, plan, migrate, report. Migrations that don't suck with Mover. Visit mover.io for more info. All right, very cool. So we thought it would be fun today to kind of talk about just the evolution of the OneDrive product of Windows, how it's changed from when it first got its start, especially with you, Jason, having 18 years of history. And I know I remember when it was still like Live Mesh and some of those original Live Mesh groups, some of those original products. So walk us through kind of how you got your start at Microsoft and some of those early products and how they came to fruition. Just enlighten some of us who maybe haven't even heard of those before. You should definitely start with our passenger pigeon (laughs) message back in the late Uh, 1890s. I believe uh, that was pigeon.net. Pigeon.net. Yeah, it worked very well. (laughs) It's kind of been an interesting journey. Files are one of the foundational computing concepts, so file sharing was like the second thing that was invented for computers. So you can go back 40, 50 years and have that conversation, and it's a kind of a fascinating voyage. If you look back at the last... 20 years, really. You know, we've kind of gone from the, the massive explosion of growth of intranet, corporate networks, you know, SMB sharing is kind of the standard for those things. And really in the late uh, 90s, early 2000s, there started to come, a couple of different products come together. If you'll remember in Windows 2000, things like Intellimere, you know, where we started building the ability to have these remote things, but cache them, kind of the capabilities were called client-side caching. Remember that with SMB sharing. And at the same time, a number of teams brought together at Microsoft started to build the thing that became SharePoint. Uh, so if you remember front page from a company called Vermeer uh, that joined Microsoft in the 90s and the front page server extensions, that plus two other groups in, in the company came together and started to build what became SharePoint. And so you kind of, it's kind of funny to think back and go, wow, SharePoint's really been around for a long time. It's been a kind of a stable crop of, of the entire ecosystem. So that kind of, you know, was where I kind of started in the, in the company in 2000. And my first job was working on Windows Explorer, designing like how would you browse all your files and work with them? And how do we get thumbnails and different icon sizes and fun things like that? 
And uh, if you remember the task UI in Windows XP down the sides, those kinds of things were, were kind of the innovations of how to make it easier to work with files. And you kind of move forward just a couple of years, and I think probably a seminal year for Microsoft was 2006. And around 2006, we bought Groove. That's a company where Ray Ozzy came from and joined Microsoft. A hugely influential person in that. Uh, we bought a company called Foldershare. And Foldershare was a small startup in Texas that had built P2P Sync and really kind of more targeted at consumers and a little bit at small businesses. And that came into the company at a different different part. And at the same time, we'd been building kind of the next generation of things that we were doing on the consumer side around uh, MSN Spaces, if you remember, and blogging. And we were kind of like, oh, we should add files to that. And as well as SharePoint itself going from kind of small departmental server to actually massive you know, portal and internet management system and content management across the board. We actually started, it was funny because I was a consultant back in those days and I was working for... A large pack. I was doing a contract work with a large packaging company, and we took a look at Groove and said, "This is great because right now we're using just consumer chat. I think we were using Google Chat, so we brought that in. We now a chat. We had a way to upload and share files, a place to put reports because we had SharePoint, but it was kind of this junk drawer where people were throwing things. There were no SharePoint administrators. It was just sort of this thing that was different from our centralized file share. But we found this as a great way to work together, to share our logs, to you know troubleshoot, to talk about." what products were being ordered and be able to have those little workspaces. It was really revolutionary at that time, and yeah. uh, it was a really great product and so different from anything yeah. else that was out well, there at that and, time. And a big chunk of that team went on to kind of carry uh, forward some of the ethos of that product into what became Live Mesh. Right. Uh, and if you remember Live Mesh, it kind of had components of server, P2P. Uh, you know, we don't talk about P2P nearly as much, but that was no. a huge yep. buzzword in the middle. <laughs> yeah. And so that was a really important kind of component with it. The other portion of that team kind of joined the Office group and became kind of building Groove for Office, which eventually became SharePoint Workspaces right. and then became this the first real sync client for SharePoint. At the same time in 2006, I started a small team we ultimately called SkyDrive, and we were essentially trying to build, you know, the file kind of cloud needs for someone in consumer. Do they have to beep it when you say that? or, or no, we okay? no, we're, we're good. Okay. We're, good. Okay. we're good making a historical reference to SkyDrive. Got it. Perfect. As long as we stay historical. Right, we're good. Yes, we that leads us anything. into the whole, um, yeah. yes, the whole yeah. legal yeah. naming yeah. issues. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, fun times. <laughs> and um, so, but, you know, we we started there kind of from what was in the Windows Live organization, and folks remember Windows Live is really kind of a package of consumer services that really started with Windows and kind of bringing more internet capabilities directly in there, but extended to things like MSN Messenger, which at its height was absolutely massive as, as a, a messaging service with hundreds of millions of users. And I actually spent a couple of years working on that, which was a fascinating for okay. me personally learn about scale yeah. at, well, at that. I have to thank you for that because MSN Messenger was what my now wife and I used back in the day. She was down here in Florida. I was in Michigan. Oh, we, used, wow. we dated between the two of them. So right. we used MSN Messenger for like, because video chat yeah. was just coming oh, out. And that's awesome. We, we dated over MSN Messenger back in the day. <laughs> we, we didn't have anything in the protocol specific to that, but I'm glad that it had that, that capability. It's fascinating what ones and zeros can turn into. Yes, yes it can. <laughs> that's, uh, so we kind of started uh, building all of these things across the company, and over the course of several years, we started kind of building more and more capabilities they, they uh, kind of latched on. So if you'll recall, we actually started things like the what we called the WAX, the web, the word, uh, sorry, web application companions, which were Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and OneNote. And their first version was on SkyDrive. They debuted there and then eventually shipped as part of SharePoint. And that was kind of going from building, here's the place you can share a file, you can upload a file, you can download a file, maybe you can comment on a file, to a place where here's where you can collaborate on content. You can build new things. And it moved from just being kind of this world where we were shipping bits just between two endpoints or three endpoints to a world where the cloud really existed and everything was now an endpoint and everything yeah. connected into it. You fast forward from there, we brought together a lot of those technologies. And if you look at you know, things like the OneDrive Sync Client today, the OneDrive Sync Client today has its roots in the folder share sync work, the mesh sync work. On the server end... The old briefcase that uh, we used to... Yeah. Oh, briefcase. Remember briefcase? Briefcase? briefcase is a great story, yeah. right? Briefcase. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. And um, you know, all of those kinds of things then combined with our consumer service, which reached pretty tremendous scale at that point, as well as SharePoint, which has become you know, the de facto standard for how you do 
business on the internet. And so those things kind of we brought together as a set of teams in 2014. And that meant actually bringing together the consumer and business sides of the house. And the idea was kind of like, what's the best of all those things we can bring together? And, you know, it's, it's funny. Today we talk about how the, the different kind of components you might use to communicate or manage or work with people. But it's, you know, only five, six years ago that we had so many different ways to choose just for files. How do I move a file around? And we made a huge effort as part of that process to say, okay, let's have a single mobile client. We'll call it OneDrive, and that's where I can get to access to all my files, whether that's my consumer files, whether it's my work files, whether it's my school files, all of those come together. And the same thing for the sync client. Let's have a single sync client. It needs to work with OneDrive, SharePoint, it needs to work at home, in the office, it needs to work at school. We brought all of that together and unified those things there. And we've done it the same with the web UI. So now if you figured out you need to put files in the cloud or get access to files in the cloud. As soon as you've learned it, it reapplies everywhere. Uh, and we think that's kind of a really interesting thing as you start looking at how so much of the evolution of work and life is kind of a merger together. You know, we talked a little bit this week about how, like, you know, today people do work everywhere. You know, like, how many people get up in the morning and pick up their phone from their bedside table and check their email? Right. Yep. You know, how many people are on the bus, you know, responding on teams or checking that that presentation they're going to do today and making sure they've really got it in their mind? Well, I think the big thing about that is what a lot of companies have realized as they and it's very different from the Windows 7 time frame is work is no longer a place. People are working from anywhere. They want. They go, you know, I work better in a cafe. I work better at home. I work better in a closed office, in an open office. I work better off of a Mac or an iPad or off my phone in this instance. So being able to get out of that Windows-centric mindset and go, we want to allow people to work from anywhere on any device at any time the way they want is going to allow people to be more productive has been a, a huge thing for us. And I think even as you walk through Microsoft, what's interesting is outside of a few departments, you see a lot of iPads, you see iPhones everywhere, you see you know MacBooks, you see Android tablets and all of this and different people. I use my Surface laptop, which I love, and it's really my workhorse, but I go to meetings with my iPad Pro and my, my Apple Pencil and I take notes and do that and I can easily grab a file and share it to that. But my de- using known folder move, my desktop and my, my documents are in sync. So whether I'm on my phone, my laptop, whatever, I can get to that content. I can work with it and I can be anywhere walking onto a plane and go, no problem. Here's that document and opening that up. And that's always sort of been the goal and moving from the old groove cl- client to the new OneDrive client to make it more stable and faster and a better experience. And what we've done through the integration with Teams and having the same share dialogue across every platform, every app, has been moving towards that, which is the goal our customers want. Because the biggest trend has been a move away from, in our Windows, you know, 2000, XP, even Windows 7, Vista timeframe was, we're going to secure the device. We're going to lock down everybody's device and choose where they can go and what they can do to. Now, we can't do that. People are using, nobody's using one device. The average person is using two to three, and some are using more, um, is now to secure the data. So between Office and Windows and Azure and all of our partnerships, being able to support Azure Information Protection, the DLP that's built into Office, IRM, and all of these things, to be able to support that and have that move across and then to allow users to pick that level of security from, yeah, I'll share this with them, but they don't need to have a Microsoft account, but I want to block download and only have it good for a week or so. All of that now can be done because it is now about sharing the data, managing the data, and knocking down those walls, but also still making sure that IT has some control over it. Yeah, it's really interesting. Like Something you said, and it was a comment I made earlier this week to somebody where we were talking about being at the conference, being here, and they said, oh, so you get like a week away from the office. And I sat and I (laughs) thought about it, and I was like, well, the office has turned into wherever I am. Right. There is no office. It is no longer a place. Right. It is... The office is here this week because yeah. I do. I'm I'm a Mac guy. I have an iPad, a MacBook Pro, an iPhone, but yet I'm an Office 365 consultant. I do all my consulting on my Mac devices, yeah. and it has its it's a great experience. Even to see, like, you start throwing out some of the dates, and it's like back in 2006. And I'm like, it feels a long time ago, but that really wasn't. I mean, that's 12 years ago now when yeah. some of this stuff Blink just of an came, eye. right just came to fruition. Right. And, to see where it is now, and like you said, with the DLP, with that ability to now manage the data and 
that whole shift we've gone through in the last 10 years. Yeah, is, from managing everybody with group policy in a server to now using MDM, ADM. Yep. And yeah, I mean, what's great is if you lose your laptop, you leave it in a cab, whatever, if you're using Exchange Online and OneDrive, the moment you log into a new laptop and sign into your Office 365 account, there's all your files because you've got files on demand. There's all your email the moment you crack open Outlook. And then with MDM, ADM, with Intune or AirWatch or Mobile Iron, there's all your apps. You're right where you left off the moment that that happened. Because we used to talk about ghosting drives yep. and having to get a new laptop and ghost it and get that perfect image. And then we start talking about MDT. Now we're at autopilot. We're like, you don't even have to be connected to a corporate network to get this stuff. Oh, yeah. It's, it's a huge shift and change. Yep. Yeah. And you're a ability, like you said, to just open up a brand new laptop. Not even if you lost it, but hey, it's time for an upgrade. Get Without even having one. to join a domain right. to get Choose all that Choose your new stuff. laptop, set it on in your desk, open it up, right. and you're going because, yeah. like you said, all your files are coming down, autopilot, you're right. joined to Or I can sit in your laptop and work and log in through my browser and there's all my files and I can pick up and work and then log out and go right back to where I was at. Yeah, It's funny to hear you guys get excited about this and talking <laughs> about it because it's the things that, you know, 12, 15 years yeah. ago, we were like, what Wouldn't if we could great? just do this? <laughs> right. Why is it so hard to do? Yeah. And you think about, you know, the things that have changed are the ubiquity of network access, wireless access. I mean, no one questions anymore whether a new place is going to have wireless, yeah. you know, but remember when Wi-Fi was rolled out at Starbucks, people lost yeah. their minds over this. And that yeah, I had my PCM <laughs> card ready to go into right. my laptop with the little antenna yeah. that flipped up and yeah, yeah it would log in. Yeah. And, because now I had Windows XP and it would support Wi-Fi. That's right. And, you know, you talk about the office being anywhere. I was recently in Myanmar and beautiful country. And, you know, I just didn't know what to expect. But there was plentiful data access in the middle of these remote regions we were visiting where I could check my email, get on Teams, respond to the team, you know, review a document that someone was doing. it's cheaper and easier than laying lines right. to actually do telephone. I think it was Israel 10 years ago was the first company, it was the first country to have more cell phone users than landlines. Back when people were deciding whether or not to keep them, they were already at like 80% cell because of the constant changing nature of the country and the landscape. Cell was much easier to do than ever lying a line. Interesting. Yeah. When it comes to email, Outlook and Office 365 are fantastic. But sometimes there are things you'd like to do that aren't implemented. Sperry Software creates Outlook add-ins and Office 365 services that fill in these gaps. For instance, there are Outlook add-ins to automatically print emails and or attachments, save emails to PDF, send out recurring emails, or how about a warning when you're going to do a reply to all instead of a normal reply? Find these and many more email productivity solutions. Get started today by visiting www.sperrysoftware.com slash cloud IT. And so then, you know, it's kind of funny that we, we, we see all that. And then yet, you know, all of us, well, most of us arrived here on a plane and the Wi-Fi opportunity there sometimes is amazing and great and you get work done. And sometimes you realize, oh, there's still the world where I have to work offline. Yeah. And kind of the balance and mix of all of that is really kind of fascinating. So how does the software build for that in a smarter way? Well, I came here in a box via FedEx, yes, so there was no Wi-Fi on my flight. But I was able to work offline with files good, on demand, good. so that was great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so going back... <laughs> it was cheap. You know, I think it's... <laughs> Good nap? Did you get a good nap? Nice and it dark? Was cold. It, was it was dark. Cold. It was dark. It was cold. It was great. I brought some snacks. It was fine. It was all good. Kind of going through that whole evolution, what like what are some of those big things that really changed that gave you that ability to do it like the internet access? Or what were some of those huge challenges? I mean, yeah, well, you know, we complain about file sync, yeah. but file sync is not easy. No, um, it's not. Well, I mean, let, let me ask this. <laughs> what was your aha moment when you as a user of this technology went? This is my jetpack. The jetpack is finally here. I'm still waiting for my jetpack, but this is this is equal to that, where you could not have <laughs> imagined yourself, whether it was the first time you got Wi-Fi on a plane and texted somebody or called yep. somebody or, you know, using this. What was that first time you got to that situation? So let me ask you that before we tell right. you how we got there. Let me think. Besides Groove.exe going away and something <laughs> actually starting to work... <laughs> Fair enough and absolutely true, and, and I can't disagree that with you. That was one of them. I'm trying to think the biggest... Where you were doing something or working from somewhere yeah. or able to do something, you went, okay, this is kind of cool. This is cool. Do you know what? In all honesty, it was probably back in the Live Mesh days yeah. when it was started to come about where it's like, I could have a file on my desktop and I could have a file on a laptop and actually have that file 
I'm not going to say synchronized flawlessly, but, no, but roughly it started, stay in sync. Right, it started say, staying in sync, and I was like, I can actually have two devices right. and have the same file on both devices and not use a floppy drive or like the 100 megabyte zip drives right. or burn it to a CD yeah, to or, get this file back and forth between them. It was the same file on both devices. Yeah, no, I, I think that's actually, that for me was a huge moment of that kind of recognition and the, the way it materialized, it was very physical. I no longer had to take my laptop home to do work. Yeah. Right. Yep. And that, like, that opened up a lot of those opportunities even before the smartphone era where I was like, oh, now I just get access to the data and I can work at home. I have a yeah. you know, PC at home, no problem. I don't have to carry a big heavy bag with big laptop and cables and whatever in it. That changed, I think, that dynamic yeah. in a huge way. You know, one, one of the funny things is we used to spend a lot of time concerned with and thinking about how are we going to solve bandwidth costs and bandwidth scale problems. And so that's one of the reasons that P2P was so big for so many services. And I think you go back to you know Napster and, and its ilk to really kind of see how that exploded on the scene. But that was something internally at Microsoft we spent a lot of energy on. Like, okay, well, you know, how many data centers can you really have? And today, you know, we have, you know, hundreds. Yeah. And you get to this point where you realized, oh, there was a crucial inflection point on the technology side where the bandwidth co- prices dropped enough, the scalability of hardware and running data, you know, machines in the data center went up. You know, there was an era where we always kind of thought you just had to buy the biggest possible machine to run a service. And now we run these on relatively low cost, lower end devices that are, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of them in racks uh, in order to actually make that happen. And so I think that kind of, you know, from a technology perspective, the shift to having relatively low cost, highly scalable bandwidth and network connectivity around the world changed the computing model. And that meant things like, you know, you could always have, even if all your computers were off, you could still have access to the file. Even if you didn't have a device with you, you could still have access to the yeah. file or your email or messages or whatever. Those, those were some of the big moments internally. And I think the other stage of development that maybe in some circles doesn't get enough credit is the evolution of the browser to become a truly flexible programming framework with JavaScript and what you see people build in terms of web apps today. You know, frankly, the the success of things like Electron is really built on the fact that as a technology, the web has arrived in a way that works everywhere for so much and certainly isn't the only way to do anything. But, you know, if you work today in the browser and you build a document, you're doing things that are much more efficient, much easier to do than they were 10 years ago. That changed, I think, also kind of what the requirements out of any of your devices were. And then the last one that I'd, I'd call out has just been the development of mobile applications and the you know the easy accessibility on your phone of being able to yeah. find and download. I was just going to say, I mean, here's a picture of my daughter from 2004. I took that picture on a regular camera. I have stored that on my device. Now it's in OneDrive or whatever I take. The fact that I can find a picture in less than 30 seconds, go right to that date, know exactly when it was taken, have all of that information, and then. Do that one minute, and then the next minute go over and work in real time off my phone on a document that three other people are working on and chat about the edits and go back and forth, and then quickly hit a button and upload that to Teams where I'm with a large group working with folks and we're able to say, yeah, this looks good or that, let me bring in this version, without having to leave a mobile device? That was unthinkable even five years ago, to be able to do that off of a device and then say, oh, I'm just going to go to a browser or I'm going to go to my laptop and pick up right at that yep. point. That, that seamless handoff is really amazing where we can do that. I think the guys who works with Jason, a guy named Tony East, uh, who heads up our sync engineering team, great guy. I love Tony, but he has a great story where he was going somewhere and his wife was working on some non-for-profit group and she needed a file. And she goes, oh, we have to go back home. I have to email this file out to somebody. And Tony's like, no, just go to your phone, click that, click that, click that. And she goes, oh, and he goes, now just hit send. She goes, oh, is that what you do? He goes, yes, honey, (laughs) that's what I do. But that aha moment that I've done for my own family and you know other people do and they go, oh, it's right here. That's really cool. And when people come up and say, yeah, I was running for a plane, somebody needed something, Two years ago, I'd have to grab out my iPad or my laptop and do this and that, but I just went, boom, click, done. That's huge. And once people realize that, and as an IT administrator, that file's secure. 
It's managed. If you get malware, ransomware, you're good. That off your Windows desktop, you can search all those files with a push of a button. That we have intelligence now where, as an administrator, if you say, I want to secure every file that not only has this word, but I want to secure every audio and video file that has that term in it, that we can now do that with intelligence. And also say, hey, that meeting that you were just in and you just took a whiteboard photo, do you want me to share it with everybody who you were in the meeting with? To be able to anticipate that and not to have AI that's out there going, oh, isn't this creepy? We can find everything. We go, hey, here's a little help. Would this be helpful? That's really great. And it's changing how people are working. When we're part of that, that's super exciting. Yeah, that's really cool. Obstrility is your cloud enablement partner to help guide your organization through all phases of cloud migration and adoption. As the leading global brand for enabling the Microsoft Cloud, their Microsoft MVP and multi-certified Cloud Solutions Architect team has authored over 20 mock courses, the Microsoft Pressbook Implementing Azure Solutions 7533, and several Microsoft Cloud Practice Playbooks for Microsoft partners. Obstrility is the official learning partner for Microsoft, GitHub, Chef, Puppet, Databricks, Ansible, Red Hat, and many more technologies across the cloud ecosystem. Learn more about their advisory services and how they can help you reach and exceed your 2019 transformation goals at www.obstility.com slash home slash advisory services. So how much of that, like the word, the co-authoring in Word and PowerPoint, how much of that is using some of that OneDrive groove, yeah. that technology yeah, yeah. behind the scenes where you guys are able to come together with like the Office team and the Office Web Apps team and all of them to bring that whole synchronization co-authoring experience? Uh, well, in fact, the, the co-authoring system that we leverage to build out what we have today across Word, Excel, PowerPoint, OneNote, and other files has really been a joint development from day one. In particular, a lot of the folks in the SharePoint team and an internal team in Office that really handles all file stuff worked hand-in-hand to kind of build the client-server protocol and then the components on either end to enable it to work so that we could have multiple sessions, multiple people editing a document, the notion of what it even means for it to be a document in the cloud for those things. And they built and designed it in such a way that actually leveraged a lot of the things that you know people have really valued. And so it's the ability, I mentioned, you know, be able to work in the web browser and do all that kind of stuff. Cool. So we were able to build Word in a web browser and it works with that. But what's really cool is you can use Word on your desktop to work with that. Yep. And so depending on the device, you know, same thing on mobile, regardless of the client, it can pick up the client capabilities and the protocol capabilities to join that session and work seamlessly across those. And the development of it has actually continued. The technology we use today for how we do all that real-time co-authoring is actually very different than where we started, you know, 10 years ago building it. And that kind of relationship has been fascinating to watch over time because it turns out that, you know, if you only design this from one end or the other, you probably wouldn't design for a system that's highly scalable, highly efficient, that works for a mobile phone on a 3G network. But by doing that from both ends, they've been able to create that. And going forward, you'll continue to see more innovation there as we continue to look at what are the latest trends in technologies? How does intelligence apply there? You've probably seen some of the things like the ability to design your slides and PowerPoints and the AI that comes in that. Those capabilities kind of come out of that core teamwork between uh, kind of the SharePoint backend that powers this, as well as the office clients across all the different components, and being able to know more than just, hey, these are ones and zeros, but this is a paragraph, this is a word, this is a slide, this is an object in the slide, etc., and be able to expose that in an interesting programmatic fashion. That has really enabled kind of what I think will be the next five, ten years of really cool features that come out of that and capabilities to, to it, add to productivity. And then from a marketing standpoint, it's sometimes that we have functionality that we can get out quicker, but Office isn't ready and stuff. So it's also that partnership as we look at features is, hey, when are you going to have this? Like, we're ready to go, but we just don't want to do this as a silo. We've been working with Office, and we they see the value of bringing this in, but sometimes engineering teams across Windows, Office, et cetera, work at different times. So also lining that up and getting that together. So sometimes when things take a little bit longer, it's not that we don't see it's important and our customers are telling it is, but it's making sure that we can do it right, get it out. Like Files on Demand is a yep. great example, how we had placeholders, and we looked at it, and every time you had a thumbnail, it was taking up lots of room, and it wasn't fully integrated into the operating system. And, you know, there was a whole, hey, let's take a few steps back. Let's really do this right. And it was the same in getting it out, you know, for Mac is 
we really want to do this right, just not this GUI on top that works this way and that. Make sure it's part of that office experience. So that's always important as we're now M365. We really look at Windows and Office and security and management all as part of that. Yep, well, and it even seems like with Files on Demand for Mac, you were waiting for, in that case, Apple. Because one of the prereqs for that, I think, is Mojave, which right, means right. there's probably some technology in Mojave yes, that sure, you guys are relying sure. on. That yeah. It's like, you know what, maybe we had it ready earlier, but we had to wait for Mojave. And all the, all the intricacies that go yeah. into the products that you guys have and how they all integrate together, really, like from an engineering standpoint, my degree was in engineering. It just, it's fascinating to me how all of this stuff works together. And granted, like Groove XC, not all of it works together perfectly or like you'd like, but to see how it's evolved and how it, it does oh, yeah. continue to get better and better over and time. We like to describe the, the Sync client as an asymmetric system that has a kind of heuristic approach to achieving eventual consistency at scale with no guarantees of being done. That's a lot of big uh, words. And yeah, the, reason, the reason for that is, you know... He's been you waiting have, all day to say I heuristic. Know, I love it. How That's, long did you have to practice that sequence of words? <laughs> Every time I say it, it's different, actually. I never get the order exactly the same. But it's a fascinating one because yeah. it's fundamentally a conversation about the fact that the product, you know, when you think about the fact that Every file system on every operating system is slightly different. Slightly different rules, constraints. You know, the example would be go try to create files called AUX on a Windows operating system and it'll say, hey, that's not allowed. Certain file characters that aren't allowed across operating systems and across applications. The expectations that file systems built 10, 20, 30 years ago have about the file contract. You know, what does a lock mean in all those contexts? And so you have this interesting thing where sync engines are actually about trying to figure out what is the state of this content? What's your user intent? And then how do I bring those things across? Groove certainly, I think, struggled with some of that stuff. And our current you know, modern sync client is really designed to be as clever and thoughtful as possible, but really focus on the core benefits of incredibly reliable, incredibly fast, and a scalable system so that whatever you're on, whatever computing device you're on, we can continue to grow that without harming things like application compatibility. The team that works on that is just an awesome set of folks who really take that seriously and kind of you know, understand the evolution we've gone through. It's not as simple as copy from here to there and delete here you know you get into interesting things my my favorite ask for folks is always like if i if i if i drag and drop a file in explorer what are all the sync actions that should happen and when? And you know, people always say, well, it should, it should copy it as soon as it goes there and bring it up. And you go, right, but what if the ACLs on it changed? Yeah. What if the bits changed actually in motion? What if uh, the moment that I do that, the device is unplugged? You know, or half of the file gets uploaded? What should happen on every other endpoint? It's actually a really fascinating kind of uh, computer science problem. And so folks get really excited about diving in deep. And, but those are the underpinnings that then you can say, hey, now I'm happily you know, working in this Excel spreadsheet with six other people putting it together, all of that underneath the covers has to be kind of that seamless experience for making that happen. Yeah, and then what's driving that is also, you know, we have our user voice, which is huge. We look at that, and what's great is I sit in that meeting each month, but they really take a look at what are the big things that users are asking for, what are we working on, how do we balance evolutionary features, which we need to have, versus something out of the box like Files Restore that nobody else has. How do we make sure we're keeping our customers happy, but also not just do something because one big company wants it and nobody else does? We do absolutely sit with our customers. We have a lot of opportunities where they come out to Redmond, we go to them. MVP Summit and our MVPs are huge. They have a Yammer group. We look at that. We're constantly hearing what they say. And then also at conferences like this and Ignite, where we brought a ton of folks from our engineering and designing team who spent hours uh, and our support teams listening for hours to what our customers had to say. This is awesome. This doesn't work. Or, you know, in our company, we don't do things this way. We do it like this. And they're like, oh, we never really thought about that. So all of those different sources also come in. And as someone who's on the marketing side on how do we talk to our audience, how do we create the content, how we took TechNet and turned it into docs.com. And we heard a lot of, I really want you to walk me through pilot deploy, manage, secure. I take a look at TechNet and it's all over. I want a step-by-step -step guide. I want to be able to download it. I want videos. I want an FAQ. But I want you to walk me through. And it's all that sort of stuff that really drives what we do on our side of the house is we create content. We also now do a bi-weekly message center blog where we take what's a message center, we add additional information to it and put out because we heard... If I'm out for a week, I miss Message Center and trying to go back, I wish there was a single place to look at just OneDrive. And we said, that's a great idea. And we can actually do that and do it better. So 
what your listeners, what the folks who use our product, we really listen to that. And that's always at the North Star and Truth. When we sit down in a room is, you know, I was out in uh, Silicon Valley last week and sat down with a variety of large customers, influential customers who have this wide range of things that they want <laughs> and want to hear me come back saying, that's not really doable, but we could do this. And would this get them there? And is this us working with them to maybe change how they work a little bit? Because, you know, that'll get them absolutely where they want to go. Or is it us going, you know, we need to change the product or is there some sort of in-between? So doing that and, you know, for the folks who are listening, if you think your voice is not heard as a product, that's absolutely incorrect. We sit there in a room and talk about all the different things you want. We comment on all of our blog posts and tech posts. So absolutely and through social. So uh, for those folks listening, if you love what we're doing, we absolutely love to hear it. If you don't or we're not doing the right things, tell us and we'll take a look at that and what we can do. And the more people who feel the same way you do, the more that that's going to end up becoming part of that vision. All right. Very cool. Well, I think we got to wrap up. We have to yeah. go get at lunch. We have we do well, yeah, birds, like, of birds of a feather and need to go answer some questions and listen yes. to our customers and hear what they have to say. Exactly. <laughs> that was a perfect. Do you like that segue? Yes, I like that. That's why I'm in well, marketing. Thank- <laughs> Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Stephen. It was Absolutely. great to have you guys both here. Catch up with you again. Thanks, Ben. It's been great. Not a problem. Enjoy the rest of your conference, and we'll talk oh, to you guys yeah. later. Same to you. Thank you. If you enjoyed the podcast, go leave us a five-star rating in iTunes. It helps to get the word out so more IT pros can learn about Office 365 and Azure. If you have any questions you want us to address on the show or feedback about the show, feel free to reach out via our website, Twitter, or Facebook. Thanks again for listening and have a great day.